Windows is still a part of my life, just not a big enough part that I think it deserves its own SSD anymore. But dual booting off one SSD is even more problematic than doing it off two, and although solutions like VirtualBox do exist, you probably also know that they're not really gaming grade. Luckily, you can not quite dual boot if you have two GPUs and you can run Windows and Linux all at once, but I don't have GPUs, and I don't need to run both OSs at once, which is what saves me. This video is a sequel, but a worthy one. The last video was just plain not very good. And I think that this needs better representation, because this is really cool. You can have a Windows install just be a single file on your SSD, it makes it really easy to back up, you can have more control over the devices that Windows has access to, and the performance impact is negligible. All you need is a CPU that supports hardware virtualization, which all Ryzen, and I believe pretty much all Intel Core series processors do, and Linux? An AMD GPU does go quite a way into making things easier, but it is possible on Nvidia as well, and it's not horrible. And for proof that it works well, this video is being edited in a virtual machine. Here's how it performs. Actually, just, just, just wait. We need to talk about why you would do this first. Whether it be to limit the scope of what Windows has access to, or mainly for me, the ease with which you can back up your Windows install, there are lots of good reasons to use a setup like this. I can fearlessly mess with my Windows install and not have to care because I know that going back is just a copy and paste of an old file away. Plus, I can 1. not reboot into Windows whenever I'm coming from Linux, and 2. not have to deal with all the bootloader problems that Windows and multiple drives in the system can cause. Did you know that in the Windows installer, where you select the drive you want to install Windows to, it just doesn't listen to that for the bootloader. If we have a look in the boot menu, we can see that Windows' bootloader is on a Samsung drive, but then if I press on the C drive's properties, we can see that it's on a SanDisk drive. These are two different SSDs, and Windows picked the C drive as the drive I actually selected, but then the bootloader as just a random drive in my system, because it doesn't listen. Plus, it can actually save you space on that one SSD because of compression. Just like how you can compress an image or compress music, you can compress Windows, meaning that with Windows 10, Steam, DaVinci Resolve, and a bunch of miscellaneous programs installed, I'm using about 50 gigs according to Windows, but in actuality, that's only 34 gigs. Right then, so the way this works is that you're in Linux and you decide you want to be in Windows. So you open an app, press the play button, and then your GPU is actually disconnected from Linux, your CPU cores, well, all but one of them, are allocated to Windows, and then your GPU is attached to Windows. And interestingly, on that one CPU car, Linux keeps running. So, it doesn't affect your Windows performance other than your CPU is missing a car, but if you were to SSH into Linux, you can actually keep things running on Linux while your graphics card is connected to Windows. And the fact that your GPU is given to Windows exclusively is why gaming performance can be practically indistinguishable from normal, since your GPU isn't being hampered at all, unlike VirtualBox or VMware. The only huge downside that I think you need to know is that hot-plugging USB devices isn't possible unless you have a separate USB card, which I do, and should be fine if you're just using Windows for gaming, but if you want to edit things with it and you've got card, re card readers and stuff, it might be more awkward for you. You can attach devices before switching to Windows and that'll work. Also, although things should be better than last time, you should still remember that I'm not a benchmarking expert. Take things I say with a grain of salt, don't assume that I used perfect methodology, but I've tried to explain everything that I've done so that when I show you things you can hopefully see how I got there. Instead of using CapFrameX like last time, I will use NVIDIA FrameView, and for making graphs, instead of using CapFrameX built-in tool for that, I'll use LibreOffice Calc and some mild styling. Okay then, let's get to benchmarks. Windows is up to date as of the 6th of March 2023. I've got a Ryzen 5600 where I've unlocked the boosts to go up to 4.7 GHz, which it will do all car. I've got a 6600 XT with these overclocks. And and 32 gigs of CL16 3000 MHz DDR4 RAM. With Cyberpunk set high with no other settings changed and no upscaling, the averages are fairly similar, the 1% lows aren't too bad, but the 0.1% lows being so low shows that even though the averages look good, the experience of this game is not ideal, since occasionally you will be dropping very, very low. To try something more CPU bottlenecked, I set the game to all low, and the scaling was even worse for the VM. However, if I try Ray Traced Ultra, we can see that it is a CPU, not a GPU bottleneck, because the games perform almost exactly the same. 
However, I promised a near negligible performance difference, and we can achieve that. It's just that, by default, the VM set itself to a CPU configuration of host pass-through, which seems to lead to poor cache performance. If we switch that to host model, the CPU now shows up as an epic CPU rather than a Ryzen 5600, but if we look at these benchmarks again, we see that now it's very, very similar to not being virtualized at all. Then for CSGO, everything was maxed, 16x anisotropic filtering, AX MSAA, and motion blur was obviously off, text streaming was on. It actually performed better than native? That's not a result that you should rely on, you shouldn't expect games to perform better, and also importantly this game wasn't affected by the host model and host pass-through difference, but it did benchmark higher, so Take that for what you will. Next, and it's important for me, and also shows the kind of CPU bottleneck we're dealing with since the free version of DaVinci Resolve renders using a CPU, DaVinci Resolve exporting. At the same resolution of this video, 3840 by 1920, 30 FPS, um, I've applied some stabilization and color grading to just a bunch of random clips I took, and I'll be limiting the export to 40 megabits per second. We can see that native, it took 54 seconds, with five cores passed through, it took a minute and four seconds, and with six cores passed through, it took 58 seconds. Seconds. So why don't I always pass six cores through? And did I for gaming? No. Because passing six cores through means that one of the cores has both Linux and Windows on it, which does work but can lead to stuttering if Windows puts a game or your process onto that core, and even stability issues, which I did experience while trying to benchmark Cyberpunk with six cores enabled, so I would suggest that you take one car out and leave that for Linux. Also, interestingly, the scaling is practically perfect car to car, which shows that the virtual machine isn't causing us to lose any per car performance, just that we are losing a car. Because if we multiply 54 seconds, which is the native result, by 6 fifths, because we had 6 cars and then we got 5, we get 64.8 seconds, or a minute and 4.8 seconds, and we got a minute and 4 seconds. And my final note for editing is that if you pay for Resolve, or if you use Premiere, your exporting results shouldn't be affected at all, at all since those will use the GPU. Also, I didn't mention it in the video recording, here are the VR benchmarks. They're not super consequential, I just thought I wanted to mention those exist, and you don't gain any more perceivable latency by being in a virtual machine. That's all. If you're interested in doing this, if you have similar hardware to me, so a modern AMD GPU and a Ryzen CPU, you can find my guide in the description, which gets rid of any Intel or NVIDIA related things, and if you have any other hardware, you can still do this and I'll link you to a more general guide, which will be below that, which is more complicated but more applicable. This is really cool use of tech that was obviously originally designed for servers because it's virtualization stuff, but it's, it's just awesome. If you don't find it awesome, then don't do it. You don't have to. But I think that you should know about it, and so this video was, I think, a worthwhile sequel. If you want to talk about technology, I have a Discord server. Subscribe if you'd like to. Bye.